Thank you. Let's appreciate Pastor Carol as she goes down. Woo! Hey, shh. Now, when you have someone who prays for you like that every day, what? What a sweetie. <laughs> I tell you. I tell you. This is why I tell you. For those single people in the house, look for a godly spouse. Yeah, tall, dark, and handsome may not be able to pray for you against the devil. Yeah. Tall, handsome, and in the dark. That one cannot help you. <laughs> Find a man who is serving the Lord like you. Find a woman who loves Jesus like you. And you will be unbeatable. Yeah. yeah. Single people in the house, I'm talking to you right now. It's, it's, it's very easy for you, again, to believe the reality of the world. That shows you that when you want to marry somebody, you look for somebody who looks like a model. If models was a secret to marriage, the, all the Hollywood people you know would still be married. Yeah, exactly. F look for somebody who's following Jesus. If you're a woman, look for a man you can follow as he follows Christ. Yeah, yeah. Am I speaking to some single people in the house? Yeah, yeah. And let me just say this, by the way. There are some godly men in this house who are good husband material. I mentioned their names. <laughs> huh? Pastor B is here. This, this, this one is good. God. This one is good husband material, isn't he? <laughs> he is. I speak for him. Pastor Mukiyama is here. But they're, they're there. They're there. They just need to be. You just need to watch and pray. I just realized. He, I just realized he, he's already in a relationship. Pastor Clint. Hey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sule Aban. Hey, Baji. I have girls for them. I have girls for them. <laughs> I think we need to have a church matchmaking agency. Huh? Oh, so you've brought her here to receive prayer. <laughs> I tell you, you know you have good friends when they take you to the front when the pastor starts talking about marriage. They're like, Bring, here, let's pray for this one. <laughs> ah, yeah, let's, let's say a prayer in faith, by the way, now that she's here. But not just for her, but for anybody else who's trusting God for a godly spouse. Yeah. Uh, if you're trusting God for a godly spouse, receive this. Father, we thank you. Can we just, let's, let's join our faith together. Father, we thank you. And we just want to pray for your sons and daughters in this house. We know that there are many faithful sons and daughters who are serving you. Who have given themselves to be followers of Jesus. And Lord, as they do that, we take this very seriously. Because we know one of the ways the enemy comes is to try and distract them by putting time wasters and other people in their lives to distract them from their purpose. But we want to agree now in unity, in one accord, that Father God, you will bring godly spouses to the men and women of this house. We are declaring, Lord, that you will not allow the enemy to distract them in any way in Jesus' name. We are planting a hedge of fire and protection around them, Lord. And we are praying that, Father God, we will celebrate with them when you answer their prayer and you bring godly men and godly women into their lives. Father God, just like Abraham sent his servant, we're asking, send angels to them. I pray even among these who are here in this congregation who are married, you would actually cause them to have an unction to see people who would fit their friend and to introduce them. And I pray that, Lord, in this church, we will have many godly marriages, many joyful marriages of people who are following Jesus. And so, Father, even as we've chosen to follow you, we are putting this desire before you. And we're praying, Lord, even by the next gathering in February. <laughs> yeah. We're praying by the time we come here in February, Lord, we will be celebrating engagements. We'll be celebrating relationships. We'll be celebrating things that looked impossible will be possible. 
There will be joy in this house because of your answering this prayer. And all the glory and honor will go to you, Lord. For we ask in Jesus' name and God's people say it. Amen. Amen. Somebody give glory to Jesus. We thank you, Lord. We honor you, Lord. Thank you so much. By the way, let's take this prayer seriously. And let's begin to pray for each other. Pray for the people in your church. Pray for those beautiful, men, those beautiful girls and handsome men that the devil will not distract them. And make it your ministry to pray that God will bring the right people into their lives. Introduce them to each other. Yeah, we're that kind of family, isn't it? Amen. Somebody give glory to Jesus. Woo! He's in the house. He's in the house. Bless the Lord. I want to just give a shout out to uh, some of the teams that have come from uh, very far. I thank God for uh, Team Burundi. Uh, Tim Bujumbura, I know Pastor Viola, Kekelu, are you guys around? Just stand, we, we, we just want to acknowledge you. I saw Kekelu a little earlier. P Pastor Viola, where is, oh, here's, here's Kekelu, I see her. Is Pastor Viola in the house? She's somewhere. K oh, she's there. Pastor Viola, stand on your chair, you're too, okay, there she is. Can we just appreciate them, these amazing folks who just came all this way just to be with us, we honor you. Let me appreciate Team Kampala, can you stand? Team Kampala is in the house. Uh, these are our brothers and sisters who've come all the way from Kampala, we honor you, we bless God for you, we love you so much. Uh, Team Kisumu is in the house. Is Tim Kisumu here? Here they are. We oh my goodness, there they are. We bless God for you. Thank God for Tim Kisumu. Come on, Mavuno, we can appreciate our relatives. Amen. We have Tim Meru. Tim Meru is in the house. There they are. Wow. <laughs> and their pastor is here as well. To God be the glory. That's one of our new churches this, this uh, year. Tim Chuka. Do we have a team from Chuka? Oh, there they are. What? <laughs> I love the energy. But come on, Rocker, you're in trouble. I can see Chuka is about to take over. I love it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> wow. Uh, are there any other teams that have come together? Not just an individual, but teams that have come together. I, Rongai, I know you are one of us, so it's okay. It's okay. You're not, you're not, we gave you visas a long time ago, so you, you are one of us. <laughs> you're not from far. And, Tim Diani, yeah, I forgot Tim Diani, where are they? Yes, Tim Diani is in the house as well. Come on, stand up and be proud. Tim Diani, where are you? Are you just one? Where are the rest of you? They're here as well, to God be the glory. Wow. Okay. These are all Nairobi people. Tim Migori, okay, Tim Migori. <laughs> okay, I see some people at the back as well, to God be the glory for Tim Migori. Wow. You know, this has been an amazing, amazing year, and God has really expanded our family. Um, I was looking at I, I, my, my list, which is not the official list, by the way. <laughs> uh, nowadays, I, I have to listen to others tell me what the official list. I was trying to do a compilation. I counted 48 Mavuno campuses. I'm sure I'm missing some. But just this year alone, um, we have seen in the Hill City Network, We've seen uh, a campus begun in uh, Kitengela. Uh, that's, that's one of our campuses this year. There's a campus in Masi called Mwangaza, Mavuno Mwangaza. Can you believe it? Like we have a church in Masi, that's so awesome. I just found that out, by the way. <laughs> and then um, in downtown, I think we have Mavuno Jinja, which is in Uganda. Can, uh, that's, um, I'm just mentioning the new churches, Mavuno Meru, and then we have Mavuno Zion City, uh, which is a long Waiyaki way. Uh, we're so grateful for Mavuno Zion City. Those are, those are the new churches that we have there. In the South Network, uh, South Network has been busy giving birth. Uh, we have Mavuno Diani, which is from this year as well. Uh, and then we have uh, Mavuno uh, Connect, Mavuno Connects planted Swahili. Uh, Mavuno Connects Swahili. And then we have Mavuno Langata. Uh, Mavuno Royal, which started last week uh, in Tsiokimau, our second church in Tsiokimau, which is a suburb of Nairobi. Mavuno Bonden Sea, which you have no idea where that is. That's actually in Germany. 
and then Mavuno Falcon Sea, which is also in Germany. <laughs> so the seas are in Germany, not South Sea, Falcon Sea. <laughs> and then uh, in the Mashariki network, we have Mavuno Chuka, which is new, Mavuno Embakasi, and then Mavuno Harare. So we have a church in Zimbabwe. Uh, so for the first time we have a church in Zimbabwe, I'm so excited about Mavuno Harare. I think, I think Zimbabwe is one of the first countries we prayed for. Uh, in 2005 when he started asking God to help us plant churches. And I, I don't know why God just gave me such a heart to see a church there. So I'm so excited. Mavuno Mashariki, thank you for making that dream come true. And then the Lifeway Network has planted... Uh, was Sagana planted this year? But not, but not Migori? Okay, so Sagana was the first one. And then Kamakis has also been planted. And I know they're in the process of planting... Nawiri, Mavuno Nawiri as well. So, come on somebody, this is called being, being fruitful and multiplying. We have fruitful families in Mavuno Church. Can we just give a, a big shout to the Lord for all the new churches that he has allowed us to give birth to this year. I, can't, I don't even know how many those are, uh, but I, I bless the Lord for that. We've almost doubled this year, and God is just doing And I know there are others. In fact, I suspect by the end of the year, the number will have increased uh, because there are some churches that are very pregnant right now uh, that are about to give birth. Amen. They're not meeting yet regularly. So I'm counting the ones that are, are now already constituted and meeting every week. Amen. So I want to talk about unlocking our fruitfulness unlocking our fruitfulness yesterday as you heard we talked we began to just talk a bit about for those who weren't there we began to talk about the people who know their God and we began to understand this is not just a, a feel-good statement this is a, a prophetic word that was given for difficult times we are entering difficult times as a as a planet as a human race uh, we are about to face some challenging times and I don't have to be a prophet to tell you that but this prophet this prophecy was written for people in difficult times and it says the people who know their God shall be strong and do exploits you know you'll never know that you're a giant killer unless you face giants some of you have been praying for an easy life you like soft life but soft life never made giant killers yeah and and you will never know what's in you until you face the giants and I believe in this season there are giants that are coming but God is about to reveal some giant killers in this congregation the people who know their God we talked about being permission giving leaders and the fact that we cannot you know you need to be surrounded you need to be surrounded by leaders, not just by followers. You need to be raising your followers to become leaders, greater than you even. And we've talked about the fact that in this house, this is a permission-giving house. If there's something you've been wanting to do and you haven't been able to do it, actually the problem is not the house, it is you. Because you're waiting for someone to give you permission. David did not wait to be given permission to kill a giant. And maybe there's some giants that you've been waiting to kill, and the word given was permission granted permission granted and then we talked about the power of the amen and we began to look at the fact that you know what there's something powerful that comes together when we join together in one accord when we start to pray in one accord we saw an example of a, of a, of a small group in, Ma, in Mavuno Diani that made a covenant to pray covenant is a powerful word by the way because it means that we agree and we make this seal a covenant is what a marriage is it's actually making a commitment saying as far as I can with all my strength God helping me, I am committed to this thing. This is not a contract that if things change, I'll come back and tell you I've changed my mind. This is, I am committing myself to this. And we began to look at what could happen if our DGs could actually start making covenants of prayer together. What could happen if our campuses could start to make covenants of prayer together? What if our networks, what, if, what would happen if we just start agreeing together in prayer? And we committed ourselves at 20, 2024, is going to be a year of prayer for this church. And we're going to see God move in powerful ways because we believe as we build that wall of prayer, God begins to do something powerful. Today I want to talk about unlocking our fruitfulness. We're still in that theme of the people who know their God. That's our, year, our year's theme. There's some words I taught you a long time ago. I don't usually teach you much Greek. Um, and the reason I don't teach Greek and Hebrew, by the way, is not because I don't I know... <laughs> It's not because I don't know them. It's because at one point, one of my professors gave me a really powerful lesson. He said, if you're a good teacher, you don't need to show people what you know. 
Show them what God wants them to know. You know, Jesus never came and said, now when Moses said this in the Hebrew, he never said that. In fact, Jesus didn't even speak Hebrew. He spoke Aramaic. Aramaic was the Sheng. It was the common language of the time. He didn't, he didn't preach. He, he spoke in Sheng, by the way. Yeah, that, that was Jesus. He just, he broke it down to the language people could understand. He made it simple. Instead of saying, let me teach you from God, he, he would say, a farmer went to sow seed. And that's when they, they probably were next to a farm and they're watching a farmer. And he'd keep it simple. And so that's one of the things that that person taught me. And I really, it was one of my disciples who taught me that. I'm so glad he taught me that. But I taught you some Greek words, despite myself. <laughs> and I don't know if you remember what the Greek words mean. Let me see if you remember. There's one I taught you called anakazo. Anakazo. By the way, I should, I should have a reward for this one. Does anybody remember what this word means? Ish. To compel. These guys are all management. Management should not answer. <laughs> it's your job to know this. No, no, it's not. Thank you. To compel. To compel forcefully. I taught you about anakazo, which means to compel. In Luke 14, 23, it says, The master told his servants, Go out into the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. This guy has a party. His friends bounce. They don't show up. They pretend. They have other things. They're too busy to come. So he goes to the streets and to the highways and the byways and he looks for anybody who can fill his party. And he says, compel them. Like just, command, just make them come. Whatever you have to do, do it because I've got to have a party today. And I believe that this is what God wants us to do. Anakazo means to necessitate, to drive, to constrain by all means, such as force, threats, persuasion, and entreaties. <laughs> That's what it means. And this guy, they basically, he basically decides, go bring whoever has to come to this party, because this party is going to happen. And I believe that God has a party in heaven. And some of the people who are supposed to be in that party are too busy, they are too rich, they are, too, they are looking after their money. And God is like, look for the ones who are going to come compel them, make them come. That's what that word anakazo means. I taught you another word called biazo. Biazo. I'm not hearing the correct. No. Forceful. Do you have your notes? <laughs> well done. Forceful. Forceful. Which network is she in? <laughs> I tell you. Biazo means to be forceful. To be forceful. Matthew eleven twelve, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent, they take it by force. There's a force that is required. The kingdom of God does not advance without, there's a force that is, is required. When you look at Jesus' life, he was a nice guy, yes, but there are some things he did that were just force. Like, like there are some things that required exertion, force, forcefulness. Biazo means to use force or to force one's way into a thing. And you know many times people are forceful about everything else except the gospel. But when it comes to, I mean, we are forceful about our, our, our relationships, we are forceful about our marriages, we are forceful about our careers, we are forceful about acquiring the latest gadgets, we are forceful. But when it comes to the gospel, we are as timid as mice. And, 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 and Jesus says, no, 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 no. The violent are the ones who take this thing. They take it by force. God fills us with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is a spirit of boldness. 1 Timothy 1, 7 to 8, it says, The Spirit of God does not make us timid, but it gives us power, love, self-discipline. Ah, those are powerful things to have, by the way. Power. If you're a timid person, you need to understand the Holy Spirit of God does not uh, does, uh, coexist with timidity. It's time for you to understand that fear is not your state. It's not your natural state. Fear is actually a demon. Yeah. The Spirit of God is not a spirit of fear. That's what the Bible says, which calls spirit a fear. Uh, a fear a spirit. You do not have the spirit of fear. And when you are always consumed by fear then you need to understand it's because the enemy doesn't want you to understand the authority you actually have. You're living in, a, in, 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 in an illusion that the enemy has drawn around you, a cage he's put you in. Because the Spirit of God is a spirit of forcefulness, of power, 
of love. Love love means that it doesn't matter what they do to me. My response is always love. It means you can't change my response to you. It means whether you act hatefully or whatever, my love is how I conquer. Because the weapons of our warfare are not weapons of this world. For us, forcefulness is not by taking knives and cutting up people. People misunderstood the scripture and they thought that forcefulness means we go kill people to make them Christians. There's nothing like that in the scripture. We believe in the power of love. Love, Jesus' forcefulness, was he loved to the point of death. Like he loved so much that he died. And through his death, we are saved. And he says, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. It means it doesn't matter what she says to you. It doesn't matter how she woke up and looked at you. It doesn't matter whether she cooked for you. It doesn't matter whether she called you a loser. Oh, come on, I'm not hearing amens from the husbands in the house. Yeah. You have to be forceful in your marriage. You love her regardless of her response. That's what it means. That's how it means to love her as Christ loved the church. There's a forcefulness. It means even if people turn you away, you still pray for them. Yeah, it doesn't matter how I pray for you because you need Jesus. And I will be, I'm here for your salvation. I'm forceful because I want to see you in the kingdom. God gives us a spirit of boldness. And boldness is contagious, by the way. When you have a bold person around you, you become bold. I don't know if you know this. People are just waiting for you to be bold so they can follow you. Uh, Philippians chapter 1 verse 14 says, Because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord. And they dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Paul was like, if they jail me, it's okay. I will still preach. In fact, Paul was such a crazy guy. In the book of Philippians, they put him in prison. He says, because of my chains, the whole of Caesar's palace, the guard, they all now are Christians. They're all followers of Jesus. It's like you chain Paul. Those days they would put you under arrest and they'd put four guards around you. And Paul is like, all those guys got saved. <laughs> it's like, who is in prison now? Me or the guys who they have tied to me? Like the guys who are guarding Paul, I, felt, I feel so sorry for them. It's like, and he's like, okay, you guys are saved. When is the next shift coming? <laughs> it's like, because of my chain. It's like people are saved because of Paul's chains. And, and, and he says, because of my chains, now even other Christians have begun to understand, wow, we can actually stand for God. We can actually preach. For, we don't have to be afraid of persecution. Because of your boldness, other people in your office will become bold to preach about Jesus. Yeah, it's you they are waiting for. Because of Pastor Irene, there are people now who are bold and binding demons. Because of her boldness, by the way, it just takes one person. God just needs one person to cause a revolution. Because of your boldness. That's Biazo. The last word, and I dare. All right, now you can shout it out. Shameless audacity. Shameless audacity. And I dare means shameless audacity. Luke 11, 8. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will get up and give you as much as you need. This man has a friend who comes to his house at midnight and knocks. The guy forgot to shop for bread. And his visitors came. Now he's waking you up at midnight. And he's banging on your door. And you're looking up and asking, what is it? You're not even asking. You're trying to pretend you're asleep. And the guy is like, I know you have bread. Just open and open. Just make open the door for me. <laughs> you're like, what the? How is this guy knocking on my door? Why didn't he go shop? Like, what, what is this? Like, how, how? He should be, he should just be, you know, some people should just be quiet with your shame. Just, just tell your visitors you're sorry. The guy is like, no, no, open. You have bread and I want bread for my visitors. And the Bible says, you normally would not open. But it says, I tell you, even though you would not get, give up, get up and give the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely give, get up and give you as much bread as you need. In fact, he'll be like, how much do you want? Just take, how, what else do you want? He, have you ever gone somewhere where your, your eyes are even closed? You don't want to lose sleep because if you open, you might go back and not be able to sleep. So how much do you want? Just take, take, take. Shameless audacity. Because of the man's shameless audacity, he got what he should not have gotten. And an idea means to be shameless. If you are ashamed to push for certain things, you'll never get them. Can I say that again? If you're ashamed to push for certain things, you will never get them. You know, I love... You, you have to admire our Muslim friends. They're not ashamed. When they come into your office and they start working for you, they ask, can you provide for us a prayer room? How many of you guys have no Muslim friends? That's what they, they say, can you provide for us? 
in my business, you want to set up your altar. Hey. Pastor Irene, did you have that happen in your gym? Yeah, I remember that story. You told me a long, long time ago. She had a gym, and some ladies came to the gym, and they said, we would love to work out here, uh, but for us to come and to bring all our friends, you need to provide a prayer room for us. Wow. What? Like, can't you pray at home, then you come to my gym? <laughs> like, they're not shameless. They just ask. They have no shame asking. And so you're going to go find airports, and you find a prayer room there. You find restaurants, you find a prayer room there. And some of them are not even owned by Muslims. You find big global chains, and they say, we serve halal food. And you're asking, how the guys I know are, not, are nowhere near Muslims. But somebody came and told them, if you want to sell to us, you need to put this sticker here. Shameless audacity. Shameless audacity. We don't, if you are ashamed to push for certain things, they'll never. By the way, there are some people who are ashamed to ask for time to go to church. And they say, look, my job has taken over my life. I can't. And it's because of your, your shame. Your shame is what is robbing you of your faith. Because I can tell you, when it's Ramadan, your Muslim friend will not be ashamed. And if the boss refuses, they will start talking about religious discrimination. Why aren't you talking about religious discrimination and you can't go to church on Sunday? Because of your job. Yeah? You're afraid. You don't have shameless audacity. Shameless audacity. Romans chapter 1 verse 16, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the defining factor of my life. When you hire me, you need to know you're hiring a Christian. Yeah. In fact, it's, I don't, I'm not ashamed. And, and I'm not ashamed of being a Christian because actually it's going to make you have a better employee. Yeah, because I'm a Christian. Because of my prayer for this company, this company will actually thrive. Yeah, I'm bold. I know who I am. I know who I am. And by the way, when I work with people, I like people who, employers like people who know who they are. As much as people think that they don't, you, you'll be surprised. You'll find in your company there are people who get away with things that nobody else does. Because they just came in and they just don't take the nonsense everybody else does. Yeah, it's true. I had a friend of mine who worked for a certain bank and he was so oppressed in that bank. Couldn't come to church, couldn't come for fellowship, couldn't come for discipleship group, nothing. And even his marriage was suffering. And I remember one day, and he was our friend, and we just kept telling him, quit that job. Quit that job. You don't think God can provide for you. And this is the thing about Christians. God provides and then you think God has no other jobs. <laughs> it's, it's, like, it's like, how broke is your God, you know? And so we kept pushing him. And one day, I think after several years of suffering, he went through so much has, has, uh, problems in that place. Eventually, he just one day just said, I quit. And he walked out. And he went home. He didn't have a plan. He just went home. And guess what happened? Within... A week, a rival bank had given him an offer. And when he went for the interview, he told them, number one, for me, I don't care anything. The first thing you need to know about me, I'm a family man. I have to leave the office. By six is the latest when there are meetings. But five o'clock is when my, my time says I leave. And they were so impressed, they hired him on the spot. And the funny thing was, the next week, the if I mention the, na the, the banks, you'd know who they are. So I won't mention which banks they are. But the, the, the CEO, the head of the board, and one other serious official bank, uh, board member came and asked him for lunch of the previous bank where he had resigned. And they called him for lunch. So he went to meet them for lunch. And they told him, why did you quit? Why would you leave our company and go and work for our competitor? And he said, ah. You guys, you don't respect your employees. For me, I'm very happy where I am. I leave the office at five. I'm with my family every day of the week. And the CEO told him, that's all you wanted. He told him, if I double your salary, will you come back and work for me? This is a true story, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> and so the man gave his notice at the old place and went back to the office. With double the salary, leaving the office at five. And all his fellow employees would look at him very annoyed. Because at five, it doesn't matter what the meetings have been called, he would just stand up and go. And they would wonder, what's wrong with this guy? But nothing ever happened to him. Yeah. 
because of his shameless audacity. Some of you are suffering because you've never understood who you are. Never understood who gave you that job. Who, who are the people who are practicing these biblical principles today? Anakazo, Biazo, Anadea. I'll tell you who are. Drug dealers. Drug dealers. Yeah. The campaign to legalize marijuana globally, it's completely shameless. Completely shameless. We even had a presidential candidate who ran on that platform. And he was very popular, by the way. You don't need to be a clever person. Just go online. Go to WebMD. Just go to any of the online platforms and ask, what's wrong with marijuana? It's so clear. It can affect your mental health. It can leave you anxious, afraid, panicked, or paranoid. It may raise your chances for clinical depression or worsen the symptoms of any mental disorders you already have. It may impair your judgment so you engage in risky behavior. It may increase your risk of heart attacks whenever you get surgery because it kills your ability to handle anesthesia. Your body can't ma metabolize anesthesia properly. It, it can impair your brain and damage your lungs. It is also quite addictive. <laughs> but some shameless people, they have muddied the water so much that all over the world people are asking, what's wrong with weed? There's nothing wrong. It's not, it's not like cocaine. <laughs> yeah. Shameless audacity. And our young people today are taking bang. They're taking marijuana. They're, they're taking, they, they, don't, they don't know how dangerous it is because of some shameless people who are selling poison with shamelessness and forcefulness. By the way, it's even become, uh, it's, it's legalized in many, many parts of the world now. In Europe, in America. Like, reasonable adults who are parents are, legalize, are actually making legislation to legalize this thing, to destroy the lives of the next generation. That's called anadea, people. Shameless audacity. Shameless audacity. Alcohol makers. Alcohol makers. <laughs> you know, apart from marijuana, by the way, alcohol and cigarettes are similar. But it's a known fact that alcohol has broken up more homes, started more fights, caused more accidents, and destroyed more young people than almost anything else in the world. But alcohol is advertised and displayed prominently in many billboards in our city. And you know, it's interesting because smiling people on the ads are telling us, alcohol is all you need. You know, if, you, if, you're, if you're depressed, just take some of this. Soon you'll be surrounded by cool friends like you. Like, people don't understand that power within you will be unleashed by just taking some of this alcohol. Shameless! Forceful! And they put a lot of money into putting that advertising there. That's called Biazo, somebody. Soft drink manufacturers. I'm sorry, today I'm doing a bit of violence to some of our careers. Soft drink manufacturers. Sugar is one of the most destructive chemicals on the market today. I'm convinced, by the way, that one day they're going to put on sodas that thing that they put on cigarettes. Soda drinking is harmful and destructive to your health. It's actually one of the most destructive things. But you see, you don't believe. In fact, some of you are, Remember growing up and then you'd, on parties, there would be crates of soda. And you just sit there and like, I, I remember I could probably drink a crate by myself of Fantas and Sprites. Huh? And it's like, in fact, even our culture is so funny. We've been so deluded now that when people come, like in my culture, when people come to collect a bride, they bring crates of soda. They bring poison to the bride's family. It's like, <laughs> like what? That's, that is Biazo right there. We've been so lied to. You know, it's interesting nowadays, cigarettes have kind of fallen out of favor. But back in the day, it was exactly the same as what soda is today. It was sold and people thought they were cool and they would drink it. I mean, they tell you that Sprite will help you become a good athlete. <laughs> Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. I mean, these are, by the way, and, and we believed it. We believed it. Some of you are addicted to these sodas. And it's just somebody has actually compelled you to become a follower. A final one we've talked about before is the gay lobby. Spending millions and millions of dollars, including, uh, around the world, including in Africa, to spread their ideology. I mean, they're everywhere. Uh, a good friend of mine told me about Kitengela and the sex workers there, and how they are promoted. 
by NGOs that very, very clear, very well funded, by the way, NGOs. And they don't come there to help them to find a trade and move away from their lifestyle. They come there to affirm their lifestyle. Uh, the, the gay sex workers, they come to aff affirm their lifestyle. They come to help them be protected and safe as they carry on their lifestyle. And, you know, it's very interesting for me because this practice is spreading in our schools and it's funded. It's actually funded. Uh, there are people in your children's schools, teachers who go, who go to seminars. This stuff is very insidious in our country. It's a little less overt, but it's there. In Uganda, by the way, it's, it, it, it was there even before here. <laughs> like much more forcefully there, I think. And I think that's why your president eventually was like, oh my goodness, what happened? But there's been a campaign to change Africa's attitudes towards same-sex uh, uh, practice. And you know, it's interesting because the teachers are recruited so that they recruit students. And they spend a lot of money for this. Compelling by force, anakazo. Let me tell you, there are people who understand the Bible better than Christians. Yeah. They are practicing the principles that we find in Scripture. Lots of people living out biblical, well, I'm not sure they are biblical principles, but they understand the principle that is in the Bible. You know, the reality is we Christians are the ones who are a little ashamed to spread this gospel. We have life. Somebody else has death. They will sell it like their lives depended on it. And we will be shy with it, holding it back, unsure of what we have. But do you understand, as followers of Jesus, we have much more reason to spread the message we have than anybody else on this earth. If you really believe that the message you have is about eternity, it's more important to anybody than anything they can ever own. Wow! Wouldn't you be driven by compassion to want to pass on that message to them so they can actually begin to understand? Because the world tells us people are blinded by the devil. The God of this world has blinded the eyes of unbelievers. And the enemy has a sizable market share in our families. Yeah, many of you, your families, when you look at your, your members of your extended family, the enemy could have as much as 80% of market share in your family. Yeah. And he's controlling your family. And, and, and we're, we're still shy. We don't understand. My goodness. Somebody is compelling people to follow a direction that is away from their salvation. And just like, we need to understand, just like any business that doesn't market, any church that doesn't share the gospel is about to die. Yeah. If we're, not, if, we're, if we're ashamed of the gospel of Christ, our church is on its deathbed. All the churches that obey the Great Commission, any great movement that I've studied uh, across the world, in any part of the world where global movements are forming today, and I told you I became a student of movement, this is one of the things that they did, apart from pray, is that they share the faith. They share the faith. They are, they are shameless about sharing the faith. Now, why do we need to share the faith? I'll give you five reasons. You know the reasons, by the way. So I'm just giving them to you because of what I'll say after that. Evangelism is sharing God's heart. It's sharing God's heart. Uh, the Bible says in Luke 19.10, the Son of Man, who is Jesus, he came to seek and save the lost. The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. That's his heart. That's why he came to earth. This is the only reason why Jesus, Jesus appeared to seek the lost and to destroy the devil's work, another scripture tells us. And how does he destroy the work? He's, uh, the devil's work by pulling dead people back to life, the people that the devil had oppressed. And whenever we share in evangelism, we realize that's the Lord's heart. The Lord's heart for giving you that job is because he wants you to be involved in seeking and saving the lost. That job you have. The Lord's heart in giving you the spouse he gave you is so that you have a partner to help you seek and save the lost. That's, what the, that's the whole purpose. That's why Jesus came on earth. That's why you are on earth. You're here to represent Jesus. You're here to be the light of the world. And Jesus' purpose is to seek and save the lost. That car he gave you, those resources he's given you, that's so that you can be involved in his work. Number two, evangelism is what makes us fruitful. Sharing the gospel makes us fruitful. The Bible says in Proverbs 11.30, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and the one who is wise saves lives. Saves lives. There's nothing you could ever do on earth that is as profitable as bringing people to Christ. Nothing else in this world will compare. 
Nothing will give you eternal satisfaction. Nothing will give you joy when you go to heaven like the people you brought to Jesus. Yeah. The multitude of people whose lives were brought into the kingdom of light because of your life. That is what fruitfulness is. And you know, God placed us all uniquely so that we can reach the people that nobody else can reach. God placed you in that family because that family needed salvation. So I really believe that in heaven, there's this matchmaking agency in heaven where they look and they say, that family is in trouble. Hey, these ones will be destroyed by witchcraft. Aha, let me reveal, let me send this one of my sons. Shua, and you are put in that family. These ones will die from poverty. And their family will be doomed because the devil has trapped them in poverty. Shua, that's the one I sent. These ones think money is everything. The idolatry of wealth is destroying them. Let me send this one. Shua, and you are sent there. It's like God put you in that place for the sake of his kingdom. For bringing people to him. That's the reason you're here. And you know when you go back, when you go to heaven, you've, you've been given a limited time. All of us have a limited time. The Bible says, teach me to number my days aright, Psalm 90, 12, that I may gain a heart of wisdom. I love, by the way, the one thing I, I, the Bible says it's better to be in a house of mourning than a house of feasting in Ecclesiastes. And I'll tell you, the one thing about funerals that's very interesting is that's the one place when everybody faces reality. Yeah, because the rest of the time we are pretending that we have all of life to ourselves. We, we, we think we have a lot of time. But in a funeral, it's like everyone's awake. Oh, 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 we may not be here tomorrow. <laughs> Nobody knows whether we're going to be here tomorrow. And that's when you start to think, my goodness, are my brothers saved? Are my sisters saved? It's interesting. Uh, I was talking to Pastor Angie, Pastor Angie Morenga, who is, uh, is here. Can we just appreciate Pastor Angie? Uh, she, amazing woman. She leads the Mavuno Marketplace movement. And, and you are telling me, Pastor, how your, your cousin passed away. And he was not a believer until the last like two weeks of his life and how it woke, woke you up to start thinking oh my god who else in my family because you know we can be walking around life without the awareness there are people in my family who are going to hell unless somebody does something about it and i remember just her telling me it just woke me up to the fact that many in my family don't know jesus thank you for that word it was a, it was a, it woke me up as well to start saying what am i doing about my family are there people who need to know jesus and i'm walking around unaware. Evangelism is what makes us fruitful. It's a most, <laughs> number three, it's a most strategic thing we can do. It's a most strategic thing we can do. We're, we, we said yesterday, we're living in what could possibly be the last days. You know, it's interesting. I'm not, the Bible is very interesting. It never tells us when the exact last days will tell us, will come. In fact, it tells you when you hear people telling you it's, he's here or he's been seen, don't believe them. Because when Jesus comes, everybody will know. It will be unmistakable. He won't come secretly to some people. <laughs> so so don't, be, don't be told that he let's starve and wait for Jesus to come. Uh, and we'll, No, Jesus will come. It will be unmistakable. And the Bible doesn't tell us when. In fact, he says even the son, it has not been revealed to anyone, including the son himself. So who are you when somebody tells you Jesus? How do you know? If Jesus himself could not say when he was coming, who can tell you the date Jesus is coming? So you'll never hear me predict and say, because of what's happening in Israel, because of this, it seems like 2029, June. Prepare yourself. Anybody who tells you that, by the way, is a cult leader. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's nobody who knows that. Nobody knows the time or the hour. Jesus continues to make it so clear. He says people will be walking in the field. One will go, the other will be left. In other words, there'll be no warning. It'll happen. So, so the one thing we know... Whenever we read the book of Revelation or the book of Daniel like we were, many people get lost in the details. How will it happen? Who will do what? When is the Antichrist? Is the Antichrist alive right now in our days? How many people believe the Antichrist is alive right now? Yeah, some, some maybe you have strong convictions. You know, people in Hitler's days believed the Antichrist was alive. He was so clearly the Antichrist. And before that, there were other Antichrists. So we don't know. The, the real answer is we don't know. All we know is Jesus says, but look at the sky. When it turns red, you know. And people say, at this time, something is about to happen. In Africa, you'd say, when the clouds turn a certain direction, you know rain is about to come. Some of you in your shags, it's almost like you know. When you see rain on that hill, take cover. 
Okay, you guys are Nairobi people. You have no clue what I'm talking about. You're city people. But some of you who grew up up country, you know, you know what this is about. Huh? It's like there's a car hill that people see clouds gathering. They're like, uh -uh, it's about to rain. Go get the cows. <laughs> rain is coming and run. <laughs> and Jesus says, there, there are signs of the times. And so even though we don't know the exact day, there are some signs of the times. He says, rumor, wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and plagues. The things that we're experiencing in our time, they're enough for us to begin to think, what if Jesus was actually about to come back? And he says, the servant who will be rewarded is the one whom the master finds doing what he's supposed to be doing. This is the most strategic thing that we can do. John 4, 9, 4 says, as long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. Night is coming for all of us. Evangelism will not exist after Jesus returns. A season is coming, by the way, and night can happen in many ways. Night can happen because a time will come when we die, like the rich man who went to heaven and couldn't send anyone to reach his brothers who are still lost. That was night. Night had come for him. His, his, it was game over. His life was over and he hadn't done, his, he hadn't fulfilled his purpose. So night is coming for all of us. Or night could be that a time comes when it is no longer easy to share the gospel. The opportunities that you have right now could close like this. I know one of the things that always amazes me is you go to the West in certain places, you cannot talk about Jesus. I remember having a job uh, where I worked uh, with children with, in, a, in a children's home, uh, state run. And it was so weird because my fellow um, workers, one of them practiced North, um, North American rituals, crystals, meditation, a lot of new age stuff. And he said, this will help the kids relax. And they were very happy for him to do it. You could do anything. But there was actually a rule. And I was told the first day I was hired, if we find a Bible in your possessions, you'll be fired immediately. This is actually a state run. <laughs> Government of California. Yeah. And they told me, I mean, you can't pray for the kids if you're a Christian. Like you could do anything, but just don't be a Christian. Night is coming. Yeah? Here you can share the gospel. Nobody will tell you anything. You can even stand in a matatu and preach. But night is coming. It won't always be like this. And the most strategic thing you can do with your time right now is to share the gospel. Number four, evangelism is how we change the world. It's how we change the world. We've always said at Mavuno that we're about turning ordinary people into fearless influencers of society. You know, for the longest time, I knew this, but I don't think I correlated it as well. You can start great things that change your sector of society. Mavuno has always been about the marketplace, changing the sectors of society, changing politics, changing uh, economics, changing family, changing media and the arts. And my desire is to see every one of us understanding our sector of society and impacting it for the gospel. But the thing that I think has become very clear is that it's not institutions that will save your society, it's people's lives. It's not, it's not institutions that will change your sector. If you're a banker, yes, you can come up with great regulations that will cut corruption in banking. You can come up with great policies that will protect consumers. You can come up with all those great things that Christians must come up with. But if you're not discipling other people, your, your, your influence is this thin. It's just waiting for you to go and then the next person comes and reverses everything you've done. So the only way you'll ever change your sector of society is through discipleship, sharing the gospel and helping others to become like you. It's the most strategic thing any Christian can ever do. And if you understand that, then you understand your job description is that you're an agent of the kingdom. God has put you on this earth to be a secret agent, to go into every marketplace, into every sector, and to turn regular people, ordinary people, into fearless influencers. You're like a virus. <laughs> you know, viruses are very notorious, huh? We, we, I remember we were in a plane uh, coming from Germany and there was a woman who sat behind us. And the minute she coughed, I just knew we were in trouble. <laughs> you know, there are coughs and then there are coughs. There are those coughs that are like, why? I asked my wife, where are my masks? And then my good wife, we have this ministry in our house, we call it clearing and forwarding. Uh, whenever she finds I've put my things and they're a mess, she, she forwards them. So she said, I threw them in the dustbin. 
because they had been in the bag for like two years. I was like, for me, when I put something there, it's because I know one day I will need it. <laughs> and right there in the plane, I'm looking at her like, the masks are in the dustbin and we're in the plane. <laughs> On a two-hour journey with a woman coughing behind us. I knew it was over, by the way. It was over. <laughs> for me, I started intercession, deep intercession at that point. I think my wife took it lightly. So, as we say in Swahili, how do you translate that? No sooner. No sooner. <laughs> oh Lord. I'm in my bedroom after we have been back for a while and I just hear that Kasim cough. I look at my wife in horror like, you got it. So not only did she not carry the mask, she didn't even pray for herself. So anyway, sorry, sweetie. We have, we have this thing going between us. We laugh at each other. But viruses are notorious. And, well, fortunately, she's a herbalist, by the way. My wife is a healer. If you, if you, she really is. That's a gift that she has in the spirit. So she, she has really, God has given her the ability to understand illnesses in a certain way. So she's well, and it is well. But you know, you're like that virus. When you're hired, the office should catch what you have. The minute they sign that thing, they're in trouble. They didn't even know when they signed it. They're all infected at that point. They are infected and affected because I'm here with the kingdom of God. I am a carrier of the love of Jesus. Yeah. You hire me, it's over for your company. Because I cannot leave this place until my assignment is done. And my assignment is to at least leave some people here who will continue the work when I'm gone. Yeah. That's your job. This is the most strategic thing you can ever do with your time. And then number five. Evangelism is how we make heaven happy. It's how we make heaven happy. My goodness, let me tell you, if you like making people happy, then you need to understand, this is how you... You know the cleverest kids, the ones, the kids in class who really did well, are the ones who knew how to make the teacher happy. Some of you never learned that skill. I want to teach it to you. Me, I learned it very young. Yeah. I learned it very young. I used to have... Okay, this one. Don't copy this for the students, huh? I used to have... I always had a book uh, on the desk. And I knew the minute that door opens, I better be looking at my book. So some of the kids would be like out there talking, having fun. And I'm sitting at the desk, even me, I'm having fun. Then I just hear, Krak! <laughs> Let me tell you, there's something good about having favor with your teachers. And then I'd always sit near the door. So when the teacher walks in, I'm the, they're the first person, I'm the first person they see and I've got the book that I'm reading. And I can't tell you how many people, times I had people say, can't you guys be like Moravi, seriously? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Look at him. Of course, I also listened in class. I also knew how to listen when the teacher was teaching. Because some people, they don't listen, they just take notes and then they go home and then they read before the exam. But for me, I made a practice of, I'll understand while it's being taught. Which then meant I usually passed. And I usually ask the teacher things like, what will the exam be about? What, what does it take to succeed in your class? But ask my kids. They tell you, I used to tell them to do the same. Just ask the teacher, day one, by the way, what, what will it take for me to succeed in your class? What does it take to get an A in this class? By the way, once you tell your teacher that, they're like, hey, 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 hey. This one means business. And they notice you immediately. It's a good thing. Let me tell you, evangelism is how heaven starts to notice you. Yeah, that's how the angels start to, whoa, <laughs> this one is serious. The Bible tells us, if you think I'm making this up, Luke 15 verse 7, I tell you in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who don't need to repent. Yeah, you bring one person to Christ and the other 99 people don't do, don't. And you're the one that will have the party. The one, you're the one that will be having the party you're about. There's joy in heaven. In Luke, that's 15.7. In Luke, that, that was talking about the lost coin, the parable of the lost coin. Luke 15.10, the parable of the lost sheep. He says, in the same way I tell you, there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Come on, somebody. Have you ever made an angel happy? <laughs> rejoicing means that they have a party. It's not just a smile. And there's rejoicing when one person 
repents. The angels know your name. Come on, somebody. Luke 15, verse 37, the lost son. But we had to celebrate and be glad because of this brother of yours who was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. The parable is showing how God celebrates and throws a party for every sinner who comes back home. The father himself stops and throws a party because of your activity on earth. What else? What else would you want your life to amount to? Why else would he say to you, well done, good and faithful servant? Evangelism is how we make heaven happy. Now, can I be real? Is it okay if I'm real? You knew all these things already. None of this is new. But you're not doing it. Why? No, I mean, come, you guys are looking at me badly like, I've just, isn't it true? Like, you know the theory. You know you should be sharing the gospel. But generally, most of us don't. So the question is, why? Could you, could you just help your neighbor and just, just tell you, just ask your neighbor for me. Like, why, why don't people, let, let's just have a small conversation. We know it. We know the theory. But we don't do it. Why is it that we don't do it? Why don't we share the gospel? What are the reasons why people don't share, even though they know that it's the best thing and they should do it? Why is it that we don't share the gospel? <laughs> yeah, and then don't hog the conversation. Let them also talk. What are some reasons that stop people from sharing the gospel? I even wish I had a mic that could get me some answers. Is there one? All right. Maybe let's hear some answers. Any, any reasons why people don't share? Like, even though they know the theory, what stops us Christians who have the best reasons to be forceful, to be shameless, to be compellers? What stops us from sharing? even though we know it's the best thing. Anybody want to share what their neighbor told them, the brilliant answer? All right, there's someone at the back there. Is there someone on this side? There's someone at the back. I think the people at the back are the ones who are with us today. All right. Okay, let's hear. Just, just maybe stand and then just share what, what, what's the reason. I think it would be the fear of rejection. Fear of rejection. rejection. And the fear is if I share and then somebody says something harsh to me, yeah, and then you start feeling like uh, maybe I shouldn't have told them ab about it at all. Maybe, the, maybe I lose the friendship. Yeah, or they start treating you weird in the office. They start treating me weirdly. Yeah. Fear of rejection. Oh my gosh. Anybody identify with that one? They start treating me like the Holy Joe. Like the, 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 the weird person in the office. Somebody has another mic. Yes. Uh-huh. Sh please share at the back, yeah. Yeah, please stand when you're sharing. Yeah. Um, my neighbor has shared. We're in one DJ, actually. Yeah. Um, it's, it's funny here because what you're sharing is what you are saying on Thursday. Wow. We actually feel like you are peeping in our DJ. Amen. Uh, so um, they said the cow died. So l let me tell you how that means. Is they say they will not evangelize because... When they wanted to pray, okay, okay. When they wanted to pray for someone to get healed, their cow was not feeling okay. So they started praying for the cow. The cow never got uh, <laughs> healed. It died. So they said they will not go and try on people. Because people might die if they pray for them. So, <laughs> Jesus. Justice, yeah. So, yeah, the cow died. <laughs> you, you, welcome the to The cow our, died. Yeah. Yes. I think I need to preach a sermon about that. The cow died. So, so sometimes we have superstition mixed in. Because that's superstition, isn't it? I get superstitious and I think I'm the one who killed the cow through my prayers. Yeah? My prayers had nothing. The cow was going to die. And I prayed for it. And you know, we need to understand that God is the one who answers prayers, not me. So when I pray, I let God do his work. And there are, there are cows I will pray for that will die and others that will live. But that doesn't stop me from praying. Have I just helped somebody there? <laughs> All right. There's somebody here. Pastor. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Don't have beef with God. Pastor Gordon says, okay, let's go. <laughs> yeah, so we, we had a couple of them. So one is pride. 
um, personality. You know, me don't like people. Me don't like talking uh-huh. to people. I'm shy. I'm, I'm shy. not that kind I'm, of person. I was not built like that. Uh, the other one is weather. It's hot. <laughs> it's raining. It's not a convenient. It's not convenient. Yes, yes. So sometimes it's not convenient. Other times maybe it's my personality. I'm just not. I'm just. I'm not a people person. Are there some people? There's some people who are. No, you're not a people person, and talking to strangers actually drains you. And that could actually be a real reason why some people are like, I wish, I wish I was given a personality like so and so, but for me, mm. I struggle talking to strangers. All right, Pastor Angie, and then we'll go on this yeah. side. Just because of, it's just recently happened for me. One is time. I think we, 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 we feel we have time. We'll have time, we'll share it. It's not the right time. Yeah. When will we do this? Because this has really come as a shock to me. But um, time is one. Yeah. And then I thought of another one. I hope I can phrase it the right way. Sometimes we feel like salvation is okay for me and it worked for me but I'm not sure it's going to work for this other person. That's the truth. <laughs> so me, it's worked for me. Me, I've worked out my way. And of course, we've had the ups and downs. The cow died. You know, drama is a lot. <laughs> so sometimes I, I just have a sense, if I'm really authentic and truthful, of saying, I don't know whether it's going to work for you. So I might lead you to something that might not work for you. Wow. But it's been working for me. So Gosh. I'd just rather be quiet. What? Somebody say what? Thanks for keeping it real, Pastor Angie. That's, that's so true. All right, at the, at the back there. Praise the Lord. Amen. Uh, one is uh, the lifestyle that you're living is not worthy of the gospel. So you feel if you're going mm. to share the word of God, you'll be attentive. So if I share, they will now expect higher things of me. Yeah. The things that I'm not myself willing to live out necessarily. Yeah. Wow. Uh, the second one, is uh, to correct with uh, Pastor Angie. We are so individualistic to a point that uh, if I've shared the gospel to me, I feel it is good for me. Why should I go around making the whole neighborhood uncomfortable with my Jesus? <laughs> it's working for it's working for me. It's working for me. <laughs> yeah, it's working for me, but I'm not sure about you and whether it'll work. But also, what she said about time. I'm too busy. I've structured my life around busyness like the rich fool. Because that's what the rich fool did, isn't it? He focused on career. He built his big business. And then the Bible says, you fool. Because your life is required of you today. Um, and, And I've structured my life around things that I'm going to live on earth. The Bible would call you a... Okay, don't say it because it's a Bible that said it. All right, we'll have Oscar there and then we'll come up to mom over here. All right. Um, uh, what I can say from having gotten born again and having the passion initially to just speak and preach is that eventually you start, uh, things catch up with you, I'll call it like that. eh? (laughs) Uh, You realize that uh, um, you believe God for some things and then you start not really believing God for some things. Mm. And I want to relate it with the prayer for this morning. We forget who we really are. And for that reason, uh, money, uh, the responsibilities that you think you have, look like they cannot be solved by God. They can be solved by your hustle and working hard. I forget who I am and I forget who God is. Wow. All right, there's one lady here, right? She'll be the last one on this side. Um, and let's, this, before she speaks, there's someone, there's somebody standing there. Okay, I think they're done on that side. Okay, so let's have her speak then. Well, thank you. It could be maybe probably for fear of what I'm, what I'm going to preach and I'm sharing the word of God. Will I be able to perfect what I am saying? Will I, what kind of influence am I going uh, to impact on other people? And what I say, will I perfect it? I may also fear that uh, maybe people are going to take me as being holier than thou, probably. Yeah. All the time I feel that I'm so holy, I'm preaching the word of God, others will feel I'm really boring them. Thank you. Oh, wow. Fear of being boring or being seen as boring. <laughs> yeah, and sometimes we want to, I want to be cool. I want people to think I'm cool. I don't want people to think I'm this boring guy who is just so religious. And then there's all that thing about, yeah, can I live, it, can I live up? 
when people start calling me bishop, because you know how people call you bishop in the office. Yeah, well, what's, yeah some of you have been called bishop in the office. And it's like, man, now they know I'm a Christian. It's like, I'm the guy they always ask to pray. Can I live up to this pressure <laughs> of being called a bishop? So, so let, me, let me say this. Why we struggle to share our faith regularly usually has to do with us. It has to do with me. All those answers we've given have to do with me. And that's why, uh-huh, this is why your discipleship group is God's gift to help you consistently be fruitful. Come on, somebody. This is why. Because your discipleship group is not about you. It is God's gift. It is a thing that will guarantee you enter heaven and people will have a celebration for you. I know, you didn't think your discipleship group was that important. You thought it was just a place you go to on Wednesdays. But I want to give you a revelation today. Your discipleship group is actually the best thing for you that ever happened to you. It is the thing that will help you succeed when you go to heaven. When I was in, 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 um, in, in Form 4, uh, I, I had a friend of mine who was such a, he was top of his class, top of our class. And he, I, I was not top of my class. Let me just say that. I was kind of far from top of the class. But I remember sitting with him and saying, help me. Help me figure this thing out. How come you're always on top? And he told me his secrets. He told me, I don't wake, I don't sleep when everybody else sleeps. I sleep at nine. I sleep early. Why? Because everybody's up at nine and they're having coffee. And they're talking. And they're pretending to be studying. He said, you guys, that's how you do it. He says, I wake up at three when all of you are asleep. I wait for the last of you to go asleep, to go sleep. Then I study till morning and I'm focused. And I said, uh-huh, tell me. How do you? And he, he just told me. And I used his secrets. That last, I just followed his plan. The last, I'd failed my mocks. You know, those exams that used to be called mocks. They're just called, they're, they're, I think somebody called it to mock you. They were just mocking you. I was mocked by my mocks. But I remember just taking his plan and fastidiously just doing it all through the August holidays, all through the third term. And shock on me when the results came. I was actually top of my school. I actually beat my friend. I actually beat my friend in the exams. So um, your, your discipleship group is that friend for you. I know. I know you've not been looking at them like they're important people. In fact, usually you come late and you say, I was with important people. <laughs> but I want to show you why this group is going to help you succeed as a Christian. Number one, in a discipleship group, we have different gifts. That's the first reason why you desperately need these people to help you be fruitful. In a discipleship group, we have different gifts. Romans 12 verse 6 to 8 tells us we have different gifts according to the grace given to us. If your gift is prophesying, prophesy in according to your faith, in accordance to your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. So what he's saying is, no one person has all the gifts. Not one person has all the gifts. It's interesting because there are some people in this church who have the gift of evangelism. Like, somehow, it's just like, every week you've let some, it's like, you, you just like people. And it's easy for you to talk, just, just point them out. Who are the guys in your group? Ijai is one of them, uh-huh. Baji is another one. I see hands being raised up there. Kekelo is one of them. But they, she, your, your wife is one of them. You know me? Okay. Do you, do you sometimes get annoyed at such people? For me, I get annoyed, by the way. The Pastor Godwins of this world. It's like I was just sitting in a plane. And the person next to me, I could see that they were, they, were, they were looking at... And so I asked them, what are you reading? And they told me what they're reading. And I told them, there's a book I want to tell you about. And by the time we left the plane, they were already in my discipleship group. In fact, I was leading... <laughs> in fact, they were even planting a church by the time we were done with them. You look at them and wonder, <laughs> Like, seriously? Like, like How? Not all of us have those gifts. And so it's easy for you to use the excuse that you are not meant to be fruitful like that person. 
But listen, Jesus did not say that you should be fruitful if you have the gift of evangelism. Yeah. Fruitfulness is for all Christians. And the beauty is, all of us have different gifts. Man, it's so nice to be in Ijai's group. I'm sure the guys in Ijai's group are so happy. Because she's the one reaching out to people. She's, she's, she, she has a way of connecting with people. Every week she's talking to somebody and sharing the gospel. I love that. But guess what? If I'm Ijai's friend and have the gift of hospitality, I can say, come to my house with those friends. Yeah, I'm the one who will host the DG because I can, for me, when I host, guys are blessed. And somebody else can say, hey, when Pastor Emma's finished at Family Night, can I just share a little thought? And I'm the one who has a gift of teaching. And when I, whenever I share, wow. Who are the people who have gifts of teaching around you? How many people enjoy when Pastor Kilonzi teaches? Yeah? It's like he breaks it down and you're like, man, I never saw it like that. You know, it's like, yeah, that's so good. And you have that gift. And somebody else, your gift is, is cooking. Oh, come on, somebody. I love the cooks. When you cook, when you cook, the angels sing in heaven. Yeah. Use that gift because that's a gift that will bring non-Christians into your group. They'll want to come back for the food. What are some other gifts that people have? Dad jokes. <laughs> Pastor Godwin's contribution to his discipleship group. But all of us have gifts. Maybe some of you are artists. You're the one who says, come on, you know, let me take a, let me take a photo of our group and then you send everybody a picture and they look at themselves and they're like, wow, I look good when I come to this group. There's somebody in Lovington who has a gift of art. Is it Gloria? I've seen the photos. When you see the photos of the Lovington people that they put on their social, you're like, even me, I want to join the church so I can look like that. I mean, that's, that's a gift of art that is being used for the sake of the gospel. In your group, there are people who have gifts you don't have. Because the way God saw it fit is that nobody has all the gifts. Everybody needs the other person. And in your discipleship group, you will find that together we can lead people to Christ. I may not have the gift. I mean, I may be shy, but there's a gift I have, the gift of intercession. Come on, somebody. And when I pray, conviction is happening. I may not be the one who will speak to the person, but I'm praying. And because I'm praying, people are coming to Jesus in that group. Yeah. When we work as a team, things begin to happen. Your, your group is the best gift to you to help you be a fruitful Christian. Come on, somebody. By the time I'm done, I'm hoping you will love your group so much. You'll be like, I'm so happy I was put in that group, by the way. In a discipleship group, we can encourage each other. Number two. Hebrews 3.13 says, Encourage one another daily as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. You know, it's interesting because small groups enable us to encourage one another, to share our strengths with each other. When people are down, when somebody is down, somebody else lifts them up. When somebody is depressed, somebody encourages them. When somebody is not able to, to, to move, somebody says, no, no, you can make it. Because the devil will attack you, by the way. And many times what he will do is he will attack you because you will pray for the cow and it died. Yeah. And at that point, it's like, I can't pray for anything. I'm useless. But somebody will pull you along and say, no, 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 let's go to 4.30. We can pray. Somebody like Pastor Irene will tell you, let's make a covenant and let's fast for, together. And as you begin to fast, you realize, my goodness, it wasn't that I, I couldn't pray. It's just that I didn't know how to. And somebody pulled me into a space where I learned how to do it together with my community. And things began to shift. Let me tell you, your discipleship group is where you will find encouragement that you can become fruitful the way God wanted you to be. Number three, in a discipleship group, we can share the load. We can share the load. Galatians 6.2 says, Carry one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. You know, some of you have prayed. You've prayed and prayed for your spouse, for your parents, for somebody close, until you've given up. Are there those prayers you prayed ardently? In fact, in the early days, you prayed every day with fire. Ah, you called down heaven on them. It's like, let them get saved, Jesus. In fact, by the end of this month, I'm trusting God. And then the month preached. Lord, okay, I'm giving you three more months. By the end of this year, they'll have... And three months passed. And now it's three years. And you've gotten to the place where you're tired. And you almost don't feel this person can get saved. But the beauty of the group is that you can encourage each other. You can carry one another's burdens. You can carry one another's burdens. You know, for me, one person who will always be special in my life is Pastor Albu. Bishop Albu. 
Uh, Bishop Albu is a special guy to our group. And the group knows what I'm talking about, my discipleship group. Because for the longest time, we prayed for Bishop Albu. I mean, we call him Bishop Albu, but he was just, hey, he did not like this salvation story. <laughs> In fact, he wouldn't come for our DG because he knew guys are going to try and get him saved. Like he'd be like the farthest, he liked us, but he's like, uh-uh, let me drop my wife. We'll pick her up later. But it's interesting because we prayed and we prayed. And I think, I think your wife had prayed for you for many, many years. Many years. Uh, these guys are almost our age. So I know that she had, she had labored in the Lord for many years. And without, without anything happening. But it became the prayer concern of our group. And we prayed and prayed and prayed. And I'll never forget in a gathering. Was it a gathering? It was in a gathering. When this one finally raised his hand to be prayed for to receive Jesus. Let me tell you. We had tears in our eyes because we, we felt like this was our person. Yeah, he's a member of our family. And today he's such a powerful member of our family, by the way. Uh, we love him so much. He's such, he's such a blessing to this church. He's one of those silent gifts that you don't see in front here. But I can tell you probably, how many, I can't tell you how many churches in Mavuno have had equipment. He, he provides equipment for church plants. <laughs> like he's a, he's a DJ and equipment and event manager and this guy has provided so much equipment to launch churches for like out of just his own free like free will to bless the church this this man you see here yeah I love this man with all my heart he's a good man yeah thank you Pasi and this is how we carry burdens I mean I, I just thought of Pastor Sheila as we did that and how it blessed her that other people took it as her burden they took it as their burden this is what your discipleship group can, can do. That child who is so far from God, you get tired. That spouse, that, that boss who is a boss from hell and you're just seeing them as a problem. Your group can give you perspective and say, let's pray. Maybe God gave you... <laughs> First of all, how did you expect a boss from heaven? The guy is not saved. <laughs> let's give you perspective on this. God put you there for his sake. So instead of complaining, complaining, why don't we start praying for his salvation? And the group can become the one that carries one another's burdens. Number four, in a discipleship group, we increase our networks. We increase our networks. Luke chapter 4, verse 38 to 40. Jesus left the synagogue, went to Simon's house. Simon's mother-in-law was sick. She had a high fever. They asked Jesus to do something to help her. He stood very close to her, ordered the sickness to go away. The sickness left her. She got up and began to serve. I mean, this, this woman was sick. In those days, fever was not a small thing. It's not like today when you take your Panadol, your Calpo, your whatever it is, and your fever goes. It's not like today. Back in the day, an infection was actually a very dangerous thing because they didn't have antibiotics. And so that fever could actually be something that killed that woman. But bless God, because there was a group. Jesus, that day DG was in the house. DG was visiting Peter's house. And as they were meeting, that family, they were meeting in Peter's house, mother-in-law is around. Uh -huh, what's wrong? Why, she, why is she in the bedroom? She's sick. Ah, let's go and pray for her. And in the bedroom, they pray for her. And the woman is healed. My goodness, that is such a beautiful picture of increasing networks. Like, you know what happens when we become Christians? We end up, after being Christians for a long time, all our friends around us are saved. Some of you, by the way, it, it's not because of bad things. One is because maybe you became effective and you reached all the ones near you and they all got saved. But then number two also, your lifestyle changed, so you stopped maybe hanging out in certain places where people would hang out. And so the friends you're hanging out with now are in worship night. Come on, somebody. They lift up holy hands instead of lifting up holy skirts and dancing on tables. And holy skirts. <laughs> So, 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 so this is what the people you hang out with now share your faith. And you can find yourself in a place where you don't, you're not really surrounded by close people who are believers. But then in a discipleship group, somebody, you end up connecting with others who end up becoming your network. I still remember a time when we went to visit, um, we went on our, our trip to, uh, actually we went to Kina Pastor Albu's uh, uh, in-law's place. And... Pastor Abu's brother, who's probably watching this, Steve, um, great man. And he's a bank manager, or was, had heard about the fact that we we're visiting his home. And so he came. He just came because I think Pastor Sheila 
being a choleric master of two limbs, stop what you're doing. My pastors are in shags. Let's go. So he came <laughs> and he hung out with us and we just had a lot of fun. He laughed. I don't think he expected pastors to laugh. I think he thought it would be very, very formal. But we laughed, we hung out, we joked. And then at the end, as we were going, we just sat around in a circle. And as we're sitting, uh, all of us in the circle just saying goodbye to the family. The Holy Spirit led me to just ask him, by the way, Steve, before we pray, have you given your life to Jesus? I don't usually do that, by the way. It's not my guess. I'm not the spiritual gifted guys like Ijai who just can ask someone randomly a question like that. But somehow I just sensed the Holy Spirit wanted me to do it. And I asked him and he said, no, I've not given my life to Jesus. And I said, would you like us to pray for you right now to give your life to Jesus? He said, and right there, the group, we just knelt by him and we led one of our members' brothers to Christ. And what a joy that was. I mean, the, the biggest thing is that uh, Steve right now is uh, trusting God to go to Australia to start a, a Mavuno church. This is a, a year and a half later. He's, he's already been discipled and he's ready to go plant a church uh, for Mavuno in Australia uh, as he relocates there with his family. That's how we increase networks, by the way. You know me, my brother is saved. So I, don't have, I didn't have random brothers waiting around to be asked questions. But in a discipleship group, and you know, sometimes also it's very hard to ask your own brother. But somebody can ask for you. Yeah, we increase networks and we're able to actually reach one another's families and reach each other's networks for the gospel. And that's why I say your DG is God's gift to help you have a consistently fruitful life. Because of some of you, when you reach, some of you, because of your DG, when you reach heaven, there will be a massive celebration. Massive celebration of the people that you brought to Christ. My goodness, people will be like jumping up and down because they, you are seen. You're finally here. The angels are like, dude, you've hosted so many parties for us. Like, we didn't, like we've always been, like every time you, we saw you around reaching someone, we started getting the, the party clothes ready. Because we knew this one, when they start having that conversation, our party is about to break out in heaven. Yeah. And it's because of your discipleship group as you work together as a team. You are shy. You are not given that gift of talking to people directly. But through the group, you're able to do it as a team. So how do, we share, how do we do evangelism as a group? I want to just leave you with this. Today's morning was more of a skills. I just wanted to really talk about something that is really, I believe, on God's heart for us as the people who know their God. This is something that's going to help us as the world becomes a difficult place. This is one of the things that I believe God is going to use in our groups to bring an impact of the gospel in our generation. How do we do evangelism as a group? Number one, pray regularly for non-believers to come to faith. Pray regularly for your non-believing networks. Second Corinthians 4, 4 says, The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ who is the image of God. Like, they're not, they're not <laughs> unsaved because they want to be unsaved. They're unsaved because they are deceived. There's a veil over their eyes. So you, it's not your logic that will save them. It is God who will open that, their eyes to see him. And so how do you begin to now agree together? That husband who's not saved, we're going to trust God together. That child who's not accepting Christ, who's re living in rebellion, we're going to join hands and pray. Like the DG should not be the place where you're trying to pre present a perfect picture. It's a place where you should be bringing those needs together and making a habit of let's pray for these people that we love together. Why don't we trust God that in the next six months, every discipleship group member will actually have at least one significant contact who has come to Christ. Imagine if you make that a commitment. You just say, in the next six months, all of us will have one person that we're celebrating in our networks. A relative, a friend, a colleague, somebody who's come to Christ because of our prayers. And we start to pray together. We start to join together and covenant together for the sake of the unsaved in our, in, in our, in our group. And make that something that you actually do in your discipleship group every week. Pray as part of your prayers. Pray for the ones, the list that you each have, your, your impact list. Share the names so that people even know the people that they're praying for. By the time we were celebrating Pastor Abu, he was not a stranger to us. We knew his name. And we were praying together in concert. And God had our prayers as a group. So pray regularly. Number two, each week, remind the group to invite someone new next time. So as, 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 as group members, have the expectation that we always have at least one visitor every week. And you know, at the... At the uh, Every, every time the group ends, just remind people to invite somebody. Next week, make sure you invite a neighbor. Make sure you invite a friend. 
uh, let, let us always have an eye towards being fruitful as a community. Always keep an extra chair for the person that we're expecting. Don't, you know, by the time we're so full that we can't take one more person, it's time for us to pray that God gives us a member with a bigger house. <laughs> or we multiply our group. In fact, by the time you don't have space, that's actually a good sign that you should multiply the group. Yeah, it's time for us to actually move because now new people come and there's no place to sit. It means our group cannot be fruitful anymore. So this is the time to actually say, okay, which, which is the next house some of us are going to so that they can meet so that we have extra chairs. And always make sure there's an extra space or two for somebody. So the members can actually see visually there's a chair here that needs to be filled. Like make it a, a commitment as a leader to always have that chair. And then of course, remember, remind, rem, as, as you're inviting people, make sure your group is welcome to outsiders. Yeah. You know, some groups are so insider language. Like you're such a click. Like if anyone comes, they'll just be feeling like a third wheel. Have you ever gone on a date and you're the third wheel? Like guys are just, oh honey, oh, oh, oh and you're there with them. And you just feel like, why did you invite me? What, like what am I doing here? I'm clearly not necessary. I'm the third wheel. It's like a bicycle that has a spare wheel. I'm the spare wheel on this bicycle. Yeah. So don't become those groups where you speak just your own language, you have insider jokes. Make sure you always explain what the jokes are for the person and then keep it real. Keep it honest. One thing I found that's very interesting for people who've forgotten because you're not a Christian, for, you've, you've either grew up in a Christian home or maybe you've just been a Christian for very long. The one thing I've realized that makes you an attractive person to an unbeliever is when you keep it real. Just keep it real. Don't try and pretend. Like, like share your struggles. Hey, they just talked about this in family night. Guys, hey, me, I struggle with this thing. It's not something that I find natural. When you start to pretend and it's all like, oh yeah, all of us lift up holy hands. And, it's all, and people look at you like, are you guys for real? But if you keep it real and you're able to share your struggles, you will find that people are able to be attracted to what you're saying. And so make sure that you keep, it, keep, keep the group real. Make sure as a leader, you're always making sure, hey guys, let's keep it real. I'm struggling. Who else is struggling with this issue? How do we deal with our struggles. Keep it honest. At Mavuno, by the way, one thing I love about Mavunites, having said that, one thing I love about Mavunites is that they keep it real. Like, I've never known a church that keeps it real like this church. Pastor Caro and I always laugh because we get the chance to work with many people from other churches. But we're always like, hey, Mavunites, they can keep it real. Like, like Mavunites go like, in conversations. Like, how are you doing? Hey, my maze, I don't... Like, in two minutes, you're like, how did we end up... <laughs> Like, I just think that we, because we've been keeping it real for so long, that people have just learned to be real with each other. I tell you this because sometimes I try and do like a door group for people from other churches, and I'm so frustrated because it's like people act like they're afraid of being known. But I love you guys because you know how to keep it real. Yeah, I love this church for that, by the way. Like, people don't, people don't, people don't pretend. I love that. May, may it always be true of our church, by the way. Because I think it makes you attractive to people who don't have faith. When they come and find people who are like, yeah, it's, this is how we are. These are the challenges I'm facing. And they keep it real. So each week, invite someone to come next time. It's very interesting because as I've looked at movements across the world, this is something that they practice. John Wesley, as, as early in the 16th century, this is one of the things that he put as a rule for his small groups, the founder of the Methodist Church. He said they have to be honest and they actually have to not look like unapproachable saints, but instead look like saved sinners. Uh, you know, sometimes Christians can look like unapproachable saints. But he says, no, 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 you need to look like saved sinners. There's a difference between those two. And I believe that God, this is why we're afraid people think we're holy. No, no, no. Nobody, by the way, people don't detest holy people. They detest holy people who are pretending. Yeah. If you're genuine, genuine holiness is being able to say, I aspire to love Jesus. I'm not there yet, but I'm really keen to do it. And I struggle, but I love him with all my heart. That's, that's holiness. Holy Joe is that guy who's like, oh man, you guys are sinners. You got issues. I can't believe you struggle with a thing like that. <laughs> that's not who God is calling us to be. Number three, share testimonies. Share testimonies. Make sure that there's a space in your group when you share testimonies of people who've shared their faith. If I was in Ijai's group, I wanted to share a testimony every week. 
because testimonies strengthen us and encourage us. Anybody who had a conversation about faith with a member of, uh, in their workplace, anybody who invited someone to the group, and maybe this person said, I'll come next time. Give a chance for people to share testimonies. And celebrate whenever people have conversations that lead people to Christ or that are actually uh, uh, inspire people to start looking Christwards. Just allow, you, you, you basically, they say you get what you celebrate. So if as a group you celebrate that, that's what you'll get. The next week you get more testimonies. And the next week you'll get more testimonies. So share testimonies. Number four, I just want to finish quickly now. Plan fun events. Ah, some people, now some people you can see the spiritual gifts coming out. These are the people, party after party. You didn't know that was a spiritual gift. Yeah, yeah. Some of you, by the way, you got saved and you're party animals and you're still a party animal now. Except now you can party for Jesus. Amen. Yeah. It's a beautiful thing. So be the one who in the group is like, hey, we need to have a party, guys. And one of the things I challenge the groups is at least, at least once a season, you should have a party. At least once. Like do something fun. Go like roast some meat. Do a hike. Go do a board. Like do a game night. Just do something that is fun. And then all of you invite at least one friend to that party. Yeah. Just get them to come in. And when they come, just have fun. You know, have fun. Enjoy. Share your stories. Get everybody to share a story. And then afterwards at the end, pray. And just say, hey, this is a welcome to our group. We have a party like this just to get to know people. And we meet every week on Friday, so we'd, on Wednesday. So we'd love to see you come. You're so welcome. Have a party. Like Jesus had parties all the time. Uh, by the way, that's one of the things I think that attracted me to Jesus. Back in the day when I was like, religion is very boring. I was like, but this guy had parties. Hmm. He was even accused by sinners I mean, by, by, by righteous people being, he liked, to, he, liked, he liked too much fun. He's always, they're always eating and just having fun, you know, with, with funny people. But Jesus says, the son of man came to seek and save the lost. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to be where the lost people are. I'm going to be doing parties. I'm going to be trying to reach them. So do a party. It's a low pressure environment where people get to know each other. They realize Christians also laugh. Oh, they're also fun people. <laughs> I didn't realize. They can, they can actually compete. Some of you, by the way, in board games, you're so dangerous. I, uh, <laughs> and they're like, what? Pastors can do that. Oh, Pastor Shix is dangerous, huh? <laughs> by the way, if Pastor Kilonzi says someone is dangerous, that person, I fear them. So Pastor Shix will never play board games with you. I can tell you. <laughs> Pastor Kilonzi, so we fear him in our group. So if he thinks you're, you're there... But I can, I can imagine if Pastor Shiks hosts a game night, it's going to be a fun night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So have, don't be so, so religious and boring in your groups, guys. Laugh together. Yeah, it also builds just joy in your group when you have fun together. Like, like, like do, a, do a trip. Go visit your shags, one of your shags. And then invite a few non-Christian friends to come and join you. Yeah. Let them see that you're real people. And it's such a joyful thing to do. And then number five. My last one, number five, is plan a monthly outreach together. So I'm going to say what I mean by that. One of the things that I've come to, be, to, to understand is one of the most powerful ways to share the gospel is by loving the society with people who are not Jesus. Like, when you go to a children's home, when you go and minister to children in a slum, when you go and do some kind of outreach like that, that is actually bringing hope to the hopeless, dignity to the ones without dignity, and you invite your non-Christian friends, there's just something that that does. It's a genuine reflection of your faith that preaches louder than any words you could ever preach. And one of the things we've been challenging our groups is saying, listen, do at least one morning every week and I want to challenge us to try this in 2020, 2024. Every month, at least one outreach. It could be a Saturday morning, uh, whatever works for the group, a Sunday afternoon, whatever works for you guys. But adopt something in your community. Find a need and figure out how to meet it together. And go with your group and make this the thing we do once a month. Like, just that. Make, and, and by the way, do it. It, it, doesn't, it can be fun. You know, go and do it and then have some, like, like, like eat and a meal, meal together after that. Go have pizza after that. 
And when you bring your non-Christian friends, include them in that. And I want to tell you that I don't even know why, but it's one of the most powerful things. I find that when people who are not believers come and see you, the Bible says, by your love, they will know that you are Jesus' followers. When they see your genuine love for the poor and you're serving them, it just says to them, there's something real about these people. And so that's a little thing that you can do with your group. I want to challenge every discipleship group. Start to think about it. Start to pray about it the rest of this year. Next year, every month, at least once, let's reach. And you know, you're killing two birds with one stone. You're blessing society, which is a beautiful thing. And by the way, even the place you're blessing, you can even preach the gospel there. So you might even find there's a great place here as you're, as you're ministering to those children to share the gospel, to start taking them through Mizizi, whatever it is. But in the process, bring your non-Christian friends along with you. Your group, your discipleship group, is God's best gift towards your fruitfulness. You know, you may not even know, but I believe that a time will come when you will enter heaven and you will thank God for the people God has put around you right now. They will have such a huge impact. There are those friends in your life that have a huge impact in who you become. When I look back in my life, I can think of significant friends for Pastor Caro and I who just because they were in our life at a certain time changed the trajectory of our lives. And we became completely different because of the friends we had. You are really the sum total of the friends around you. And that discipleship group is your spiritual community. It's the one that's going to help you not have any more excuses for fruitfulness. What is it? Why, why not determine as a dis discipleship group leader that your discipleship group will multiply in 2024? Yeah, because you'll not have any space for the new people who come. Why don't you tell the members? If I was a DG leader, by the way, this is what I tell my members. Tell your, tell your members, my job in your life is to help every one of you become fruitful. And in the first six months of 2024, a member of every one of our networks will give their lives to Jesus. And that's my role, to help all of us get there. And then let's start living like that. I'm, I'm giving a leader here, a permission-giving leader, an opportunity to lead their people to the next level. Here's how you can do it. One of my favorite times, by the way, is family night. I want to conclude and say this. I love family night. And one of the things I like, by the way, one of my favorite times at family night is check-in. When groups are checking in. Those of you who've never come to Family Night, it's every Wednesday, 5.30 on YouTube. And all our discipleship groups check in. And I love that time when it's like, who are the first three guys on the podium? Who are the ones who checked? Yeah, you know, it's a leaderboard of Family Night. And we usually have one on, uh, on Facebook and on YouTube. And one of the things about it is, it's made certain groups very globally famous. So, some of you, your DG has never featured. But there are DGs that have featured... And they are known across the whole Mavuno movement, whichever country we are in. Beat Your Body DG, that's one of them. BFF, Discipleship Group. Like everybody in Mavuno knows BFF, by the way. Laguna Beach, although they used to be famous, they've kind of dropped nowadays, but I remember. Are those ones on the little board? You know, some people are just shouting their names. I'm not sure about this. Sold out. His vine, I've, I've heard that one. His vine DG. Yeah. Zion DG is one. Yeah. I, it's true. Which one? And by the way, if you hear me not, me not repeating yours, it's because I've never heard of it sometimes. Eh? Just, just say it loudly. Jesus culture. I think I've seen it one, a few times. Yeah. Like, like your DG is known. And people say, like, it's like you always, people are like, ah, these people are there again. Yeah, there are those, those groups that their names are famous because they're known again. You know, yeah, BFF, by the way, is one of those ones. Consistently famous. Like people know you guys in Germany, they know you in Malawi, they know you in Kampala, they know you. You're famous. Why am I sharing this? Wow. I see your discipleship group being famous in heaven. <laughs> I see the angels shouting the name of your DG every week. I see the angels beginning to celebrate whenever, the, whenever your group comes together and your name of that group is known in heaven. I see people coming to Jesus because of you in 2024. I see a revolution starting because of your group. I see nations being changed because of your group. I see God helping you that every member of your families will come to Jesus in 2024 because of that group. By the way, there's some groups. God is about to do some powerful things in your group. Right now, I'm not just speaking. I'm actually prophesying. 
I see some of your groups, are, some of you are going to find your spouse because of your group members and the prayer that will pray for you. I see you becoming fruitful, fruitful because of that discipleship group that you're part of. Ah, these are not human, these, these are God's agents that he's placed around you. Don't look at them the way people look at them. Look at them as an agency that God has put you in to help you be fruitful. That group, that group, it's an important part of your spiritual life and your spiritual life is the center of your living. It's the most important thing you can ever do to be fruitful. And that group God has put you in, it's not just a group of people. It's your space for fruitfulness. It's your space for fruitfulness. By the way, my prayer, my prayer is that by next year, when we have this gathering in 2024, everybody in this room will have at least one name of somebody who's come to Christ. Close person you've been praying for years. Every one of us, somebody that came to Christ because of you and the prayers in your discipleship group. And right now, some of you can even visualize that person. It's a parent, it's a spouse, it's a child, it's a friend. There's someone who will have come to Christ by November 2024. I pray for you, every one of you, you will experience tears of joy. <laughs> you know, you know, you know, there's some things that make, that make, that they say, boys, we have been taught not to cry. I can tell you the day Albu gave his life to Christ, me, I cried. Shamelessly. I just wept. You will weep in joy in 2024 because of people around you who will give their lives to Jesus. Yeah, you will weep. I pray that every group here, every week, your name will feature in family night in heaven. <laughs> every week. By the way, it doesn't take a lot. If you're 10 of you, it just means one person every 10 weeks or every 11 weeks, which means one person every season, one of my contacts every season. That's it. It means we're working as a team. That's how every week someone can come to Christ because of us as a group. And all I have to do is invite them there. I may not be the one who shares the gospel, somebody else will. Every week in 2024, I pray that your name will be shouted in heaven as a group. Yeah. They'll be shouting, BFF again, has done it again. Beach Your Body has done it again. Laguna Beach has done it again. Sold out, oh my goodness. Yeah, this is my prayer for you. And by the way, I pray that all your groups will multiply next year. Fruitfulness, fruitfulness. That you'll be meeting as an extended family. Ah, so you'll be coming together with all your people from other groups and you come and have your party when you come for that Nyamachoma. And you'll be a hundred and you'll be wondering how did we grow like this? Because God has made you fruitful. Oh, come on, just begin to raise your hand right now and say, I want to be fruitful, Lord. Pray for fruitfulness. I don't want to just live and waste another year. I don't want to assume I'll always have time. Ah, time is ending. I don't know when the sun will come, but I want to be fruitful before he comes back. I want to have fulfilled the purpose God put me on earth for. I want many people to have come to Christ because of me. Yes, I want my name to be shouted in heaven by the angels and my group as we bring people to you next year, Lord, and this year as well. Lord, give me fruitfulness. Give me fruitfulness. Thank you, Lord, for everyone who's praying right now. Thank you for everyone who's raising their hand in the heavens. Give me fruitfulness. Give me fruitfulness. You know, I remember one day we went to Redemption Camp, the RCCG Camp, and there's a place in the ground why they took us, the guy took us. I don't know if you remember that story, Pastor James. And Reverend Adeboye, he's one of the men I really admire. He, I mean, he's at another level. And he's the leader of the RCCG movement of churches, over 50,000 churches. And they took us to a place where this man prayed. And this man, by the way, he prays five hours every day. Uh, that's his standard practice. But they took us to a place where it is said, where he said that one day he prayed and said, God, <laughs> give me fruitfulness or kill me. Like, I don't want to die fruitless. And he stormed heaven and said, God, make me fruitful or I die. And what they told us is that day there was an earthquake. And where he had been standing, the ground parted. 
In fact, remember that pastor told us that they had just filled out that place. It had been left open as a memorial for years. And he was showing it to us. He said, this place, the ground parted. It was exactly where he had been praying when that earthquake came. And he said, God, make me fruitful or I die. And you know, on his 80th birthday, I still remember that I think it was 10 million people came to Christ. 10 million. <laughs> they made it their goal in their church. 10 million people are coming to Christ as a gift to him. And people came to Christ. Uh -uh. Some of us, we need to start becoming discontent with mediocrity. I'm just living in this job. I've been here for five years. Nobody has ever come to Christ. God, make me fruitful or take this job away. Lord, make me fruitful. I didn't come to earth to just breathe oxygen. I didn't come to earth just to make money. I'm going to die and leave it here. The other day, we buried my dad. And I remember walking, as we were walking in the garden. And it was so interesting because God just showed me a very powerful thing as I was walking towards his grave. Because to get his coffin to where he had marked his grave, the guys who were there, I think it was Kina Pastor Albu, had to cut a certain tree down. And it struck me, that was my dad's favorite tree. He loved it so much, you couldn't touch it. But he was gone. And nobody really cares after you're gone. What matters is what you left, the souls you left here on earth. Yeah. Those jobs that we are so busy doing, those things that are keeping us too busy to be fruitful, that we cannot even think about the people around us, you will leave them here. They'll go. They'll go. There'll be nothing. But the thing that will matter, the thing that will matter when you get into heaven, uh -uh, is that somebody came to Christ because of me. That's your crown. That's what Paul calls the crown in glory. And so, Father, I speak over your sons and daughters. I see them with crowns on their heads. I see jewels on their crowns. The names written on their heads of all the people who are coming to Christ through them. I see us not wasting any more time. Lord, the days are dark. Darkness is coming when we will no longer be able to share the gospel. But I'm praying that, Lord, you will set a fire in this church. You set a fire in our groups that we will not be content to be mediocre. We will not be content to run after things that we're going to live here on this earth. Give us a hunger to see people come to you, Jesus. A hunger to see people in their destiny, walking in purpose. And Lord, I pray that for everyone here, that our family members will come to Christ. Our loved ones would come to Christ. We will cry those tears of joy this coming year as we see many, many people, a harvest of souls in every one of our campuses. And so I speak this blessing over you God's people. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and God's people say it. Amen. Amen.